make sure to do the whole thing next time. Um, pretty much everyone did good, though. I think it's only a couple people that did that. Uh, on another note, you guys have another assignment this week. It is a short essay um, using your skills of analysis that we've been working on the past few days and the ones that we're going to continue to hone next couple of days to analyze a artwork. Um, because it is a short essay, please just choose one artwork. If you choose too many or an entire study or a series, uh, that would be a book. Not a short essay, but don't do that. Um, and if you're worried about whatever artwork that you choose, just ask me ahead of time and uh, I can confirm whether or not that one will work. Most likely to work. What's your name? Corey. I'm going to get you marks here. Uh, are there any questions about that short essay? Today. Anyone online have questions about the essay? Okay. All right, then. Let's go ahead and get started. So, oops, I should have shared that before I do that. <laughs> you guys should be seeing a PowerPoint online right now. Courtney, can you see that? I see um, a Teams thing right now. Okay, then it didn't show up. That's why I always ask. How about now? Yes. Okay. It did that last Friday, too. On another note, our new computer came in. It is sitting right next to me on the floor. <laughs> he didn't have time to hook it up yet. So uh, that should be hooked up today, and you'll have a brand new computer to work with that is running on updated systems tomorrow. So that's exciting, especially the online people. As for the rest of us, today we are going to start going over We're going to start going over the different things that go into creating a composition. Um, this is, in my opinion, the most boring lecture ever, but that's because it's the most basic things, and I find the basic things very boring. Uh, so today we're going to be discussing things like lines, shapes, colors, and yeah, so we're going to be discussing what a line is what colors are, what shapes are. Uh, so I find this particular lecture to be a bit monotonous um, in that sense. But these are all of the things that go into creating a cohesive composition for an art piece. So it is kind of important that we understand them. So that being said, once again, we're going to be going over quite a few different key terms, starting off with two-dimensional and three-dimensional. Um, Two-dimensional is something that's on a flat surface, and three-dimensional is something that is not confined to a flat surface, but we all probably knew that already. Okay, so this is just one example of all of the different things that we're going to be talking about today. All of those bold letters are what we're going to be covering. Uh, we'll probably end up taking two lessons to do that. Um, but starting today, we're going to start going over lines, shapes, mass, space, time, motion, light, color, and texture, and discussing what those particular things are. And we're also going to be working on how we can apply those different 
techniques to art pieces. For example, the first one we're going to look at is Gerhard Richter's OOAA2, and we're going to look at all the lines, shapes, mass, space, time, motion, light, color, and texture that he used. Now, most artworks you would not apply all of these things to. So in Gerhard Richard's OOAA2, first we're going to look at the different lines that help depict the shapes. So this is, of course, oil on linen. It looks to be like it's a graffiti piece, but it's not. Uh, we use oil paint, we an airbrush technique to do it, um, which is why it looks like it's graffiti. So here we have a lot of different lines used. Those lines help define shapes. For example, the lines used to depict this man's body. This would have been done using a stencil. Does anyone know what a stencil is? Yeah, yeah, it lets you outline or trace something. So what he did is he made a stencil of a guy and then he used the airbrush oil to fill in that stencil, um, which is how he got these defined lines and shapes. Now we'll look at math. Um, so certain colors, although we'll get into what colors are in a second, uh, certain colors have more math than others. For example, the black in the center, black is the heaviest of all of the shades. Uh, so that's why that math in the center of all black is the heaviest object in that picture and has the most math. And that's where we get very um, technical and it has to do with how our eyes and our brain view colors, although technically black and white aren't considered colors. Um, and then, of course, you see a unclear space or depth with the background. So what he's done with this particular composition is he has made a foreground and a background. The foreground here is where that man is running on the ground. And then you can see an unclear, undefined background behind him, kind of like a landscape. And of course, also with the background, um, we have implied motion. Come back to time in a second. So because because this man is clearly he, he what is he doing? He's running, so he's running through something that's implied motion. He's not actually running, but it's implied that he is running in this flat surface. And of course, the passage of time is signified with the paint dripping down on that painting. And then you see lights and darks being used in this particular painting with the breakthrough of the canvas in the background. So the spaces that are white are actually pieces of canvas kind of group. And that is juxtaposed to the black in the foreground. And once again, uh, this one's obvious, the bold uses of color and the texture that given thanks to that airbrush technique. Uh, it's a super complex analysis of a particular painting. And this is a rare example in which you can apply all of those things to a single art piece. Um, as we go throughout this lesson, we're going to be looking at every single one of these um, words and the ways that they're applied to composition by artists. Uh, so not all the time will we be able to apply all of these things. Keep that in mind. We are going to start off with the most basic one, that is line. Now this is where it gets a bit monotonous as I go through and tell you what lines are. You probably know what a line is, right? <laughs> so the lines that we just looked at in OOAA2 
helped give shape and depth to that particular painting. Uh, other ways that you can use lines are to direct um, the viewer's eyes. We're going to be looking at that quite a bit. Um, and it can also create movement and action throughout painting. I have a question. Are we supposed to see anything on our screen? Because I don't see anything or a slideshow or anything like that. Good. So you guys got to tell me soon because um, it always says it's sharing on my end and then it's not. So Alexa, you should see something there. Okay, I just don't see anything like a slideshow or anything. That's Derek, um, are you seeing stuff? Yes, ma'am. Okay, then Alexa, it might just be you, because Courtney said she could see it and Jarek can too. Uh, so Alexa, what you're gonna have to do is log out and log back in. Okay, okay, thank you. <sighs> that happens a lot too. Where's just one person? Not on the wall. So the next example that we're going to look at specifically for lines does help show paths of action and help direct the viewer eye. Um, so that's Bismarck, North Dakota, which is a photograph. This one has a whole lot of different lines in it. We have the lines created by the shadows as well as the lines of the buildings and telephone poles. Um, so constant intersections of lines that lead our eye throughout that photograph. Our eyes should be constantly moving and not really have a place to settle. And that is thanks to the use of lines. So there are a lot of different kinds of lines. There's active and static, aggressive and passive, sensual and mechanical. Um, they can help define volume or mass of those objects. Um, they can show patterns, textures. Once again, they can lead to the eye. Uh, so now we're going to look at some different examples of lines. You don't have to write these unless you really want to. These are just titles of art pieces that we'll be looking at again later on in this semester. Uh, so we're going to look at um, movements of color lines, which have a graceful curving line, um, which I like to consider to be a little bit more sensual or feminine. And then in comparison, 
we look at Alexander Radchenko's Untitled, these lines are a lot more aggressive. And then, of course, another use of lines here. Um, this is being on a flat surface. We see this used in a structural format in the installation uh, using neon tubing. So once again, a reminder that lines can help create mass. Uh, the lines here are the entire sculptural piece, so they have created the mass of the sculpture. And they also help to lead the viewer's eye. So some other characteristics of line uh, we can see in sandback black yarn here. Uh, this gives us um, uh, an implication that there are rectangles here. However, this is just yarn. And a very opposite in comparison example of use of lines. Lines can also help give us texture, such as the cat fur on T.P. Smith's finger. Which was made with individual lines. And lines can also, once again, give us implied shapes. So the lines used by Mark Chagall in I am the Village here give us the shapes of all of these objects, which, if you're trying to figure out what this is, this is a surrealist piece, which means it's based on reading. Moving on from lines to shapes, and this is a little bit more complex now, not really. Um, so these shapes, there's a couple of different kinds of shapes. There's geometric shapes, which are like triangles and squares. Organic shapes, which are a little bit more irregular and curving. And like we've been doing, we're going to look at some examples. The other kind of shape, and the last one, is biomorphic. Biomorphic shapes suggest things that you might find in nature. Shapes can also help us add to background and depth, particularly in photographs and paintings. Um, so the way that you place shapes in front of other shapes can help us in our brain create a depth or illusion to depth on a two-dimensional surface.
So your figures or your positive shapes are the dominant shapes that are in the foreground, and your ground or negative shapes are in the background. If at any point I'm going too fast or you need me to clarify this, let me know. So here's our first example of shape. Here we have an implication that there is a circle as well as a square here using the different shapes. Um, of course, because the circle, well, the center circle is done using black and black tends to go to the background and white tends to come forward. Um, it would be that the square done in white is your figure and your circle done in black is your ground. And that has to do with color theory, which we'll talk about later on. And I've got certain colors push and pull. Certain colors push forward and certain colors reduce. Some other examples of shapes are MC Escher's Sky and Water, which is a fun one. It's for your ground reversal. That's where there is a shift in between shapes. So it's one of those images where you can see uh, two different things at one time. You've ever played with those. Um, and then we will look at verses untitled after that. That sky and water using the figure ground reversal. So up top you see the geese, and then below you see the fish. However, the geese are still actually there, it's just to reverse the colors. Once again, using black and white. And then, of course, Katrina Gross's Untitled. This is a great example of that um, biomorphic shape that we looked at. So something that looks like it might be organic or found in nature, but not easily recognizable. Most often when we talk about organic shapes, we'll be talking about abstract art or sculpture. And moving on from shapes to mass, it's things like line and shape that give us mass. Um, I've also noted that colors help to give mass to certain things. Uh, so mass is how like bulky or physically solid something looks. And then volume is when mass encloses space. So think of like a room for volume. We're going to be comparing a couple of very um, easy to comprehend examples for mass, looking at Fernando Botero's The Horse, as well as um, a Giacometti sculpture.
for all of these things that we're going over today, I wouldn't think too hard. Usually your first impression is probably right. Uh, so lines make shapes. Some shapes have more mass than others. They just snowball from there. Here is that Botero piece, the horse. Does this have a lot of mass? Yeah, well, hi, how? <clears throat> it's very bulky. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell us that this has a lot of mass. And in juxtaposition, what about this one? Does this one have a lot of mass? No, why? Slim, skinny, right? Yeah, especially in comparison to the Bozero horse. So, actually, let's get this one. Let me find it out. <laughs> you get mass. Mass is like easy to comprehend for me. Um, with this, which object in this Lino cut has the least amount of mass? The bread, exactly. That once again goes back to the fact that white weighs less than black. Um, so when we get to the color theory section, we'll also have to apply that to math. Uh, so black recedes in space, meaning it has more weight, whereas white pushes out into the foreground, meaning it has less weight. Moving on from mass to space. So when we're referring to space, a lot of times we're talking about architecture. Um, however, we can also be referring to two-dimensional spaces. If you remember the Gerhard Richter painting, OOAA2, there was an implied background space to that flat surface. Oftentimes the paintings are just to try to create a three-dimensional um, space on a two-dimensional surface by placing objects in front of other objects. However, also in architecture, the room that you're in has in space, not an implied one, but an actual space. Guys, don't let me let you leave without telling you about tomorrow, okay? <laughs> I'm liable to forget. So I meant to tell you at the beginning and I already forgot. Okay. Uh, so the first example of space that we're going to look at is the design for the north terminal, which is here. Uh, so this particular building, this is, this is actual the well, this is a photograph of the building, but it has space in it, correct? Would you say this has a lot of space or a little bit of space? A lot. Why? Mm -hmm. It's empty, yeah. So it's very empty. What else help, helps to add to the sense of there being a lot of space? High ceilings. High ceilings, the arches, and the large glass windows. All of those things help create the sense of there being a larger space than there actually is. Uh, so those are different things to keep in mind when we talk about architecture in particular. Because more often than not, most architectural spaces try to create the sense of being larger than they actually are. But this is actually really good space. Not the most. What about this one? 
what's going on with that wall in the back? It's trying to make it seem like there's a larger extension to the wall. Yeah. So what they did is they added rope lighting around the side to make it seem like this wall was a little bit further out than it actually is. Okay, sometimes we see space being used once again in a two-dimensional format um, to indicate, for example, with the ancient Egyptian painting that we're about to look at, that there is more than one room to the location. Sometimes it's used to create depth for the painting. There's two ways to do that, our linear perspective and atmospheric perspective, which we'll talk about today. Early ancient cultures, they had issues trying to figure out how to denote different spaces. Uh, and what they would do is show everything all at once. Uh, they did this with animals and people too when they were illustrating them. Uh, for example, they would, um, in particular, when they were showing the people, they would show them their side like this, and then their face would be like this. So they wanted to show the front of the body as well as the side of the face. Because it was the human profile and the human shape of body, they had to know who you were and what you were. Um, so they would show things in an interesting way, which includes buildings, which is what we're going to be looking at with the pool in the garden. which you see here. So here we see a pool and it is inside a garden. However, this is very much not realistic looking. It's very flat. Uh, they were trying to use the different spaces and illustrate an entire backyard on a flat surface all at once, um, paying no lines to try and make something look three-dimensional. So here we see trees growing from somewhere below. Uh, trees growing from the sides and the top, as well as fish and beasts. The interesting thing about Egyptian, just I know, is they did a very good job of illustrating animals in a three dimensional format, just not people or places. Because those are definitely beasts and fish. Okay, like I keep saying, there is implied death. For death particularly with um, paintings that due to the overlapping of different objects and shapes that helps give our brains the idea that, well, that has to be behind something else. So there must be depth to this flat surface. It's obviously the Egyptian painting that we just looked at did not have that. Also, the idea that things shrink the further that they're going back in space helps give implied depth. Because when we're looking at something, the further away the object is, the smaller it is.
So here we see the use of all of those things. So we see that overlapping different objects helps to give us the sense of depth for six, particularly would be here because they use overlap, a smaller size and vertical placement. Vertical placement is the idea that the lower something is to the picture plane, the closer it has to be, whereas the higher up in the picture plane it is, the further away it must be. Also, the idea of placing objects on front of each other helps create depth as well as shrinking them in size as they go back. So those are just different tips and tricks that artists, particularly painters, use to try and make things look like they're three-dimensional. There are particular times in art history where artists do not particularly care about making things look three-dimensional. We go through phases. So a great example of implied death can be seen in Cezanne's So Life with Apples, which we see here. You don't have to write that much if you really want to. This is just another example of implied death here. So we see the lemon in the foreground. He's overlapping the apples. And then we see the stacked apples. I wouldn't use this as a reference for perfect three-dimensional objects, though, because Cezanne particularly didn't care about if this was actually a table setting, that plate is tilted up. So the back is obviously go up. Um, yeah. So continuing the idea of trying to create a false sense of space within paintings, we're going to look at linear perspective and atmospheric perspective. So Perspective means trying to make something look three-dimensional even though it's on a two-dimensional surface. And these are two tricks that a lot of artists will use to do that. Linear perspective is a system of perspective that was developed during the Italian Renaissance thanks to something called a camera obscura. Um, and with this, uh, it uses a mathematical system that relies on a vanishing point on our eyesight and a horizon line. It's the idea that all lines in a painting should converge at that vanishing point in order for things to be proportional. The more proportional things look, the more realistic something looks. So Cezanne in his still life painting was not using linear perspective. If he was, that plate would not look like it's floating. And it wasn't that he didn't know how to do it, he just chose not to. So before we get into this, let me just show you an example. Let's just go forward a little bit. I thought it had it. Maybe it doesn't. So we'll look here. So this is just a small picture of a road. And that's the idea that um, for things to look realistic in a painting, there needs to be something called a vanishing point. 
a vanishing point happens along our horizon line. So that's literally like the line that a horizon would be on that if we're looking far enough away, we would see. Uh, an easy way to find a vanishing point is if you take a pencil with an eraser, hold it at arm's length, and wherever the eraser is would be your vanishing point along your horizon line. That's the easy way to do it. Uh, it's super easy to do in hallways with tiles like this because the tiles will end up taking you to your vanishing point. So here we see a road. The vanishing point is located along the horizon line. The horizon line is literally the horizon of the landscape there, and all lines converge at that vanishing point. Here's another vanishing point that occurs along the horizon line that helps keep all of those cubes in line. So that they look like they're correctly made. So vanishing point uses something called um, one point perspective. So that's the idea that we're getting one viewpoint to look. Which once again is the example of the road or those blocks that we just looked at. There's one vanishing point in that picture. So we're going to look at linear perspective used in a painting called The School of Athens by Raphael. Linear perspective not only gives us our um, vanishing point and horizon line, but it also helps us get our scale correct. Uh, usually, if you can figure out the dimensions of the lines that you're originally using to make your drawing or sketch, then you can figure out the ratio that your object would need to be as well. So you're literally using rulers and numbers and math to figure out the correct sizing that you need for these paintings. And of course, like it says, there are certain paintings that have more than one perspective. We don't usually look at those in this class, but if you take it like other art history course, then we would get into examples of those. And here is the School of Athens. Any guesses as to where that vanishing point is? We follow lines. So the all of the lines and up. 
right in between these two guys, yeah. You can kind of make out the horizon line here too. It used to be architecture to create that horizon line. So your vanishing point is right here. So then you see all of the lines diverging from that point, and those lines help us keep in ratio all of these people. So that they aren't funky shapes. And of course, the further back we go, the smaller the figures get, the closer to the foreground the people are, the larger they are. And we're going to be analyzing this one quite a bit when we get to the Renaissance period. So um, because our vanishing point is right here on these two guys, that tells us that those two men are probably the most important people. And those two guys are Plato and Aristotle. And this is called the School of Athens, which means this is all about learning and education, which makes sense. Plato and Aristotle are your central figures in that painting, since they are important philosophers. Of course, if you really, really analyze it, you'd probably be able to pick out all of the people. Mm -hmm. And here it is without all of those people in there. It's a lot easier to figure out those lines and where they go in now. And you can see that horizon line very clearly too. So most often when artists are doing sketches using linear perspective, they will start off doing the background and then they will add in the people or whatever they're doing afterwards like this. And of course, the other thing that artists can use to try and make things look more realistic is something called atmospheric perspective. It's not nearly as complex as linear perspective. It's just the idea that the further in the back something gets, the hazier it gets, or the less legible it is. This is more often seen in things like landscape paintings. Um, the further in the background that landscape is, the more hazy things are, so it looks like it's covered in a bit of a fog. Also, the colors will not be as rich in the background. And our examples of atmospheric perspective are Durand, Kindred Spirits, and Shenzhou's Poet on a Mountain Top. So once again, atmospheric perspective is just the idea that the further back in your landscape or your painting you get, the hazier things are and the less legible objects are. Follow this. That one's pretty easy. And here's another example of atmospheric perspective. The further back your mountains go, the less clear they are to see.
questions about linear or atmospheric or structure, because those are probably the hardest things that we're going to go over today. You guys online good? Now we will move on to uh, time and motion. So time can be an implied time, like the paint drips in OOAA2. Same with motion. That man's motion was an implied motion. He wasn't actually running. It was implied that he was running. Sometimes time and motion can be literal, um, such as the Aztec calendar that we're about to look at. The calendar literally shows the passage of time. So the passage of time can literally be seen in this calendar. It's a little bit more implied with this painting, though. This is a story about St. Anthony and St. Paul meeting. They're meeting down at the bottom. But here you can see the journey that the saint had to take before he actually met his Christ. So there's implied passage of time of him having to go on his journey. Some other implications of passage of time can be seen in things like comics. Um, you see from pain to pain as things are progressing in the storyline. And some more obvious examples are film and television. A really cheeky example of the passage of time is Christian Mark plays the clock. Of course, people try to write everything. This is just example, you guys. You don't have to write all these. <laughs> I see them scrambling. <laughs> so this is an example of a comic book. As you read through the pains, the story progresses, showing the passage of time. And then this is Christian Marquez, The Clock. The Clock is a um, looped video of 24 hours of him just filming the clock. So literally showing the passage of time. OK, now we're moving on to motion. And we're going to start off with implied motion, which we've already looked at with that OAA2. But we're going to look at implied motion with dancing Krishna and Bacchioni's dynamism of a human body as well. So that's the idea that we can gather from looking at an image that is supposed to represent something in motion. It might not actually be moving. Sometimes we can look at some sculptures called kinetic sculptures that actually move, but more often than not in art, we see implied motion. So our first example of implied motion is that Dantan Krishna you can tell that it's supposed to be someone dancing. It's supposed to be moving. It's representing motion. Uh, this one's a very complex example of motion. This is an art piece done by the futurists that were very interested in uh, trains, planes, and automobiles. All of those things move very quickly, and they try to represent the quick movement 
in an abstract format because we were also implied, or inspired by Cubism. So this is actually a football player. Done it. So you can kind of make out his feet there. That one's more complex as an example of motion. Okay, another example of implied motion is Jenny Holzer's Untitled. This one's a lot easier to comprehend with the ticker tape. Uh, so if you've ever seen the news, you see the little bottom that then runs around in a loop. Uh, so this is located at the Guggenheim, and it's just a ticker tape that reads a uh, sentence over and over and over again. So it's literally moving around the museum. The literal motion is not so much implied, it's literally moving. And some other actual motion examples are Alexander Calder's kinetic art. So kinetic art is a sculptural piece that actually moves in space. Alexander Calder is the first artist to make kinetic art, and he makes something called mobiles. Um, so if you've ever seen like a baby mobile, it spins around. That's pretty much what Calder's pieces do, but they're not mechanized at all. They just rely on air current spinning them. So here is that mobile. These are very large. Some of them are smaller, um, but this one is extremely large and it will spin around. Moving on from time and motion to light. So this is where we start getting into that um, idea of color as well. So in case you didn't know, colors are just refracted light. It's science. Don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> uh, so when light moves through space, it ends up being reflected back to our eyes um, through prisms. So the colors that we actually see in real life are just light being reflected back to us. Certain wavelengths reflect back certain colors. But light is extremely useful in art. Um, the use of extreme lights and darks actually has a name in the art world. That name is Pierre Scuro. Uh, using extreme lights and darks can help add depth, dimension, and drama to a piece, such as French's study of the Lincoln Memorial. So here we see two images of the Lincoln Memorial taken at different times of the day. Uh, depending on when you take your pictures, you'll get different shadows because that's how sunlight works. Um, so same statue, not a different statue, just different times of day. The different times of day has given us two very different Abraham Lincolns. Um, particularly, it's changed how we see him. So how does he appear in this first image? Does he put up? He doesn't look like serious to me at all. What about this one? He looks stoic and serious, very presidential. Um, and once again, this just is a study on light, pretty much. And the difference that lights and darks can make. So seeing light is called values or tones. It's referring to the relative lightness or darkness of an object. 
So the image of Abraham Lincoln that we just looked at, the second one had a strong value, uh, whereas the first one did not, which is why he looks this goofy to you. And just like everything else we've seen in Pies today, um, there are in Pies. But the main thing that I want you guys to focus on for this slide is, once again, that word there, chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is the use of extreme lights and dark in artworks. It came about during the Baroque period with an artist named Caravaggio. Uh, the book period was very much interested in trying to create drama um, and it is still used today by artists that are trying to create a dramatic effect. We can kind of see it being used in Rose of the Noor's harvest season and it helps to show volume and mass through shading here. So the extreme dark shadows are what we're talking about there. And then of course, this is just a scale to show you shading. Yeah. Clear scale. It means extreme light and dark. That's literally what it translates to in Italian. It's, the, it's referring to the use of um, shading to create depth. And then some other examples of light being used in artwork we have Keith Sonier's Motordom, which literally uses a light installation. The light can be quite literal as well, depending on how it's used. And of course, with Paul Chan's first light, this uses light and shadow with a video projection of a photograph to kind of give you a bit of an eerie feeling. The shadows. And of course, we see in Keith Sonner's Light into Art, here's Keith Sonner, uh, another very literal example of light being used in an art. Moving on from light to color. Color is the other probably complex thing that we're going to be looking at today because there's so many different meanings that come with color. Uh, colors can affect our thoughts, our moods. They can refer to certain themes, um, feelings, emotions. They can affect our health. And that has to do with the psychology of our brain that colors just automatically have certain meanings or connotations that come with them. For example, if something's red, what does it probably make you think or feel? Possibly anger, what else? Not so much excitement, what's red guys? What holiday of ours is very red? Like, what else? Valentine's Day. Right. Yeah, romantic. It's very romantic. Red is usually a symbol of romance, 
sometimes it's anger as well, or passion is the word that's usually most uh, used with the color red. Um, huh? Yeah. Um, what about the color blue? Sadness, that's what we most usually refer to today. So different colors have different meanings or evoke different emotions and thoughts from us. Uh, that's a psychological thing. It's been around for ages. It's no like art theory makeup thing that we made up for it. Um, certain colors psychologically also, also push and pull forward, which I've hinted at a few times. But we've seen color use with particular meanings for a very, very long time. I've also noted that different colors reflect based on different wavelengths. Red has the longest wavelength, blue has the shortest, and then of course you have your rainbow there, which I hope you don't need to tell you what the rainbow is. But yeah. And this is just science. You don't have to write anything in this section down. This is just telling you the science of color, which I'm never gonna expect you to remember. Um, so, Moving on, let's look at some different examples because I feel like that's the easiest way to understand color. Uh, achromatic is something that's black, white, or gray or without color. Black and white are not considered colors in the art world, but um, if we consider them colors, I won't care. It's not a big deal. Uh, colors are usually referred to as hues. What we usually call color. So instead of saying the color blue, we usually say the blue. blue. So once again, if you use color, I want to. Uh, values refer to the lightness or darkness of the colors. So if you have a dark green, it is a very dark value or shade of green. Um, if you're using white and mixing that with green, you're going to get a lighter tint of green. So adding black to a hue gives you a shade. Adding white to a hue gives you a tint. So that's why I said black and white normally aren't considered colors. They're considered shading and tinting um, that you can add to different hues to create a new value, which is just a very complex, wordy way of saying you made something lighter or darker. And intensity or saturation refer to the purity of that color, of how pigmented it is. And here is our color wheel. And this is actually where we're going to stop for today because I don't want to get into this and have to rush through it because it gets a little bit complex. So tomorrow we will pick back up with our color wheel. I wanted to say a few things about class tomorrow just in case something happens. Um, for those of us that have been sitting in class, all of the dinging that was going off on my phone was a testing of the chat alert system in case we have to cancel school tomorrow. Um, that being said, when they cancel class, it's just on campus class. So technically, this is half online, half in person. Therefore, if class is canceled, we will still be doing the online tomorrow. So feel free to join us. I'm not going to count it against you guys on attendance, those of you that come regularly. So it's not going to count against you on attendance if you don't want to do it online. But there is going to be an option if class is canceled for you to join us online. And I am going to be recording it for the usual as well, if you prefer to just watch it back on YouTube. So yeah, that's once again, just this class is canceled, yeah. Uh, Chats alert will tell you. Um, they cancel if there's like a lot of snow or ice on the road, which there's a possibility of tomorrow. So send out an alert saying on campus classes is canceled. 
So we can, and, and you heard all the dreaming that we've got out there. So that was my alert system, letting me know I got my alerts. If you haven't been getting those alerts, you might want to um, figure out how to get that into there. Yeah. Which I would guess for you early college students would be for your teacher. But you should have it. Like you did it when you signed up for class. Any other questions about that? Okay. 